<laughs> Glamour shots. Okay. So next is David. David Bryan is the Senior Managing Consultant in charge of technology with X-Force Red, IBM's elite security testing team. His responsibilities include establishing standardized tool sets and environments for project delivery and delivering on pen test projects. David has been a participant in the information security community for 18 plus years, first starting out as a DEF CON volunteer, securing the DEF CON network, and now is on the board that runs ThoughtCon, a Chicago internet information security conference. David lives in cold but beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota with his wife and two cats. Please join me in welcoming David to uh, ChillCon 2017. Hi, folks. How's everybody doing today? Good, good, good. All right, so this talk kind of explores the, 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 the methods for uh, gaining access, gaining credentials, and some of the things that we discovered, and then some post-exploitation uh, research that I sort of did fairly recently. Um, one of the things we, we want to remember is 1.2 million, right? It's a, a number to think about. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this number and why it's significant as we, we continue through the talk. Uh, I've been involved in information security for a number of years as a consultant for uh, a number of years as well, over 15 years now, I guess. Um, or 10 years, over 10 years. I've, uh, and I've been involved in the information security community, uh, been volunteering for DEF CON for, this is my 19th DEF CON, which is crazy, but a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's interesting to see the, the progression of people in the industry, well, the progression of what were teenagers and kids to people in the industry to where they've ended up now. Um, myself included in that, I guess, right? And then um, DC612 is a DEF CON, local DEF CON group. Uh, I think it's really important to support those, right, uh, if, you, if you can. Um, and now I'm, I'm with uh, X-Force Red from IBM, uh, in charge of technology. I make technology decisions and I do pen testing, right? Um, it's, it's actually a really fun job. I also believe that uh, people should have options for internet that are not Comcast or CenturyLink, if you can. And I've started my own wireless ISP, Pico ISP in Minneapolis. I have about 15 customers. <laughs> so, um, so hashing, right? I think uh, one of the things that I see very often in developers' comments in the code is encrypt the data or encrypted password. It's not encrypted, it's a one-way hash function, right? We have, to, we have to remember that so we, we put appropriate controls around that hash, right? And around the data that you're, you're uh, trying to secure. So bcrypt, right? bcrypt is a hashing function. It uses a salt. A salt is a bit of random data that gets essentially passed along into the hashing algorithm with your, your password. Right? Um, this is a cloud environment, right? You, anybody can rent this. Um, it's got eight Tesla K80 GPUs, and the speed of uh, bcrypt is just a benchmark. It's 15,000 hashes per second, right? So then in contrast, we have SHA-1, right? SHA-1 is a, another hashing function. Uh, if you look on Wikipedia, it basically says, don't trust this SHA hash anymore, right? It, um, so in contrast, we can do 14 giga hashes per second of brute force of that, right, as a theoretical benchmark. Um, there's no salt, right, unless you have a SHA-1 salted hash, which I know like AIX, for example, will do some of that. Um, our benchmark here is, again, with the same cloud-based computing hardware. So the, the path to SHA-1, right? Uh, I was essentially involved in doing a, a pen test of an application that we were acquiring, right? Um, 
And in order to, to identify right, if, the, if the application is secure or what controls were missed, I was asked to go on site, do a pen test, and this was essentially sort of a walkthrough of where I, where I started, where I got to, and finally some of the metrics that I gathered from that. So the, the, the first step is finding open access, right? Uh, a lot of companies will leave shit just wide open, right? Um, one of the first things I identified was that they had NFS shares that were open to anybody, right? At least one machine that had that. Um, what I found was what's called a kickstart file, right? It's essentially a thing that allows you to boot off the network, bring a machine up, install the OS, right? Um, I was able to log into this box, right, the one box, but it didn't have any data on it, didn't look like it was linked to anything, it was kind of a dead end, if you will, right? So, all right, I guess I have to start over again, right? Go back to, the, go back to my Nmap data, see what else is open, what else is available. Uh, in this case, there was a web application running. Uh, it was a Jenkins server. Right. Does anybody know what Jenkins is here? Yeah? Okay. So uh, Jenkins allows you basically to deploy code to production web servers, if you will. Um, it, it's actually, uh, I mean, it's a useful tool, right? It's a development tool, DevOps tool, but you, you kind of have to uh, secure it, right? Um, <laughs> uh, in this case, uh, there's no credentials to access it. You just pop open a web page and you have full access to any of the Jenkins jobs, right? Um, and there's a couple of, there's, I think there's a Metasploit module for this, right, that allows you to deploy meta, interpreter shells uh, on the box. But, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know if I need that. Um, uh, this, this screenshot is a little hard to read, but essentially there's a scripting console built into it so you can run your scripts, right? Well, as one component of the scripting console, there's the ability to run a process, execute a process as the user running the Jenkins server, right? Um, so there's no password on this machine and now you have direct access to a shell on the box. It's pretty bad. Um, so basically what you do, uh, in, in a lot of Linux distributions, they they've include netcat, but they've removed the dash E, which allows you to execute a command underneath the shell. So you could do like a reverse shell that comes back to you. But all you really have to do is pipe the output of a shell to netcat and send it back to you, right? So the first thing you have to do is make uh, a pipe, right? Basically develop uh, or a device pipe and then Take all the output, pipe it to net back, netcat, and any of the input goes back to netcat. And uh, lo and behold, you get a shell in the box, right? This is, this is me just showing this example uh, on my laptop today. I was like, well, I should, I should include that script because that script is useful. Um, this is me actually getting a shell on the customer box because um, I was able to uh, run a wget to pull back a shell script, right, via that uh, Jenkins scripting console. Run a wget, pull down the shell script, execute the shell script. It calls back to me using netcat. And here I am. I'm running as the Jenkins user on their build server. Okay. So now what? Right? I think. There are a lot of companies that would stop here and be like, oh, I found a problem, I got access to your shell, okay, done. And I don't think that's appropriate, right? I think you should go to the next level. And the next level that, that I go for is uh, looking for SSH keys, looking for private data, looking for passwords, looking for users, um, look in the shell history, 
right? Uh, a lot of people will put passwords on the command line, right? And then it logs it in shell history. Um, in this case, in the, in the Jenkins directory, there was something called .netrc. And I, I didn't really know what the heck that was because I'd never used it, right? But there was a deployment user and password and a, a mobile dev user and password, right? What I, what I found out later is the .NET RC is actually GitHub credentials, right? It's, a, it's an automated process to pull it out of their Git repo, build a, a file, and then deploy it, right? So does anybody here use Git? Yeah, I think everybody does, right? It's, it's a super great tool, allows you to do code tracking and all that fun stuff. Um, so in this case, I used those credentials to log directly into their GitHub, right? Here we can see, okay, you know, this is a, a snippet of one of the codes, right? Okay, well, that, that's, that's not good, right? Okay. Um, so then I started going through their, their <laughs> source code repository. Like, what, what attacker is not going to do this, right? <laughs> Um, and found uh, usernames and passwords, users for the, the database, passwords for the database, MySQL database. Um, I also found that they like to put things in comments in their code, right? And in this specific example, it's a comment for the actual live administrator for the Mailgun account, right? So. I then took this and actually went to Mailgun and logged in as their administrator for their account, right? Um, they also had a payment gateway administrator account. They had a bunch of other accounts checked into GitHub on their, in the source code as a comment, right? I mean, this is, this is like sanity of development 101 is just don't check in secret keys to your GitHub. All right, so now that I have the, uh, the Microsoft, or not Microsoft, MySQL password, right, username and password for root, I'm gonna go after that database because what, what could be there, right? Well, looks like we have username, user password, their encrypted password. Wait, a, I thought we had a password and, it, oh, encrypted, okay, all right. We have their email. I think at some point there's like a PayPal, there's a Facebook. I mean, it's got everything, right? This whole, whole database has all of the info that I want. Um, and, and then I went through and figured out, okay, how, how many users do we think we have here? So this is 1.2 million users, right? That's crazy. Like, Wow, that's, that, that to me was uh, sort of an eye-opener. I think that's the biggest compromise of users I've, I have ever personally done, right? <laughs> like, so out of that, I figured out that there was 820,000 SHA-1 hashes in this database alongside bcrypt hashes, right? So they had both <laughs> both password fields in their database, and they still had them, right? It's pretty bad. <laughs> like, wait a minute. So I'm gonna change gears a little bit here. Um, back about six months ago, uh, just before Black Hat, we actually built a password cracking cluster, as specifically as a demo for Black Hat, but then also for our consulting team to be able to use, right? Because we recover passwords, or recover password hashes, we recover secrets and things like that, that we all wanna be able to uh, recover it and then use it to gain access and uh, escalate or elevate our privileges, right? Um, the system that we built, we're calling it the Kraken, right? So the Kraken is sort of an homage to the, the uh, creatures in the sea, if you will, right? Um, we're using essentially two clusters with 16 uh, GTX 1080 cards. Um, 
this is sort of a, a total. We've got 86 cores, 256 gigs of memory, and four terabytes of disk. Um, it's actually a, a pretty, pretty sweet rig, or two pretty sweet rigs. Um, when I f first proposed, hey, we need this password cracking rig, I actually brought it to um, our team, and I brought it to the capital team, you know, the team that does the capital expenditures, and said, hey, we need this. And they're like, well, we have extra money. Do you want, do you need more? And I was like, <laughs> yes. So I, was, I managed to, to get two instead of one. All right, so uh, this is Bcrypt on our cracking rig is 118,000 hashes per second. Now, if you remember, on the, the cloud version, it was 15,000 hashes per second. So that's a huge magnitude of order for, for brute forcing Bcrypt. Bcrypt is slow, super slow, right? Uh, SHA-1 on these guys is 66 giga hashes per second. Um, on the cloud, it's 14. So again, an order of magnitude difference for cracking these, the SHA-1 hashes. Um, using just eight Tesla uh, or eight GTX 1080s, right? Um, they're consumer cards, right? They're about 750 a pop. But they work amazingly well for hashes, and they're faster than the, you know, Tesla P100 cards. So Tesla P100 is about a $3,000 card, and it's just awful as far as uh, computing hashes and cracking hashes, but as far as performance goes, right? Maybe it's great for games and rendering all that stuff, but. Um, and here's a benchmark. Oh, you can't see it. The benchmark's cut off. I think it's, uh, oh no. There is 334 giga hashes for NTLM, right? So NTLM is what Active Directory stores your password hash in. So if you've got a seven character password, we can brute force all eight, uh, or all alphanumeric specials and digits in um, three minutes, I think. An eight character password takes about 12 hours. So. All right, so let's go back to Dun, 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 our database. Um, so I took the SHA-1 hash, right, and basically went through and said, okay, let's, let's see who's got the same password, right? Let's take the top, top 1,000 of the same password and then just brute force it, because why not? I've got spare cycles, right? Um, I was running this stuff in the cloud and it was costing two to three thousand dollars a month, right? S extremely prohibitive, right? Uh, and that was only for two to three hundred hours a, at a pop to start it up, run some hashes, shut it down. Um, over a five-year period, we're saving like five hundred thousand dollars to to buy the hardware, right? To buy forty thousand dollars worth of hardware. All right. So anyway, back to the the hashes here. So. Uh, this is eight characters all in, which is alpha, uh, upper, lower, uh, special characters, all that fun stuff. Uh, out, of, out of those top 1,000, I loaded 997 hashes, probably some spaces in there, some other garbage in the, in the hashes. Uh, in a 12-hour run, 907 of them were recovered, right? That's eight characters all in. <laughs> so I was kind of surprised. I thought password or password one was going to be up at the top here, right? But one, two, three, four, five, six was the top shared password amongst, uh, you know, 800 and some thousand password or hashes, right? Uh, then it's password, QWERTY, keyboard walk, keyboard walk, ABC, one, two, three, keyboard walk, keyboard walk, keyboard walk, right? Um, and then I added just a simple digit to the end of it, and it came back in like three minutes, um, and recovered. 
And that, there's password one. I'm really surprised this is so low. <laughs> like, because it used to be, like, uh, I mean, when I've done password sprays on domain controllers in an environment, like, password one typically works everywhere. I think I'm going to have to. Uh, an initial oh, yeah, yeah. So this, this is what will pass an AD complexity requirement, right? This will not pass an AD complexity requirement. So that's why I always go for the password one with the capital P, because that's what people are going to use. I, I think I was thinking it through too much. I need to use, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or one, two, three, four, five, six. All right. Um, when we got our racks, uh, we got some SSD drives and a third SSD drive for our data, but they didn't include the, the, the drive sleds. So I had to use, basically make a makeshift drive sled. So that's what that, <laughs> the, uh, I think it's a, it's a cover slot for a PCI bus. I was like, all right, well, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow and I can't come back for a month because I'm doing pen testing for other clients. So um, did that to start off with. Now it's got real drive sleds in it, but I thought it was funny, like in true fashion of ordering stuff. All right, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here from SHA-1 hashes over to SSH keys, right? SSH keys are uh, very useful very wonderful for automating things, but developers do not know how to use them or store them, right? And, and to some degree, I would say a lot of system admins and even somewhat security people don't know how to use them, right? Um, kind of an epidemic of a problem. Um, that's at, uh, what is it, Paris, I think, in the, at DEF CON. Someone decided to put googly eyes on Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> I was like, hey, that's pretty funny. Um, so I keep finding SSH keys without, in, without a password lying around, right? I pulled them from, like literally from the Jenkins config files, because you can upload an SSH key that will then be used to deploy your code, right? So that's one place. Um, there was a, uh, engagement where I had access to an open NFS export, and they stored all of the SSH keys on that machine, right, F for their production AWS instances. And there's no password, and then there's a text file with the IP address for the production instant, instance next to it, right? Um, home directories, SMB shares, app configs. Uh, I always, you know, do a find for ID star or star key. Right, um, it's pretty annoying from my perspective as a as a person who wants these things to be secure to you know basically completely own everything in just a couple of steps because they haven't secured that one key. Right, um, there was a engagement where uh, <clears throat> where they they had gone through and uh, created a single root key, I think it was a single root key, yes, a single root key that everybody could use to get into an environment that was behind another box, right? So they had a box that was supposedly a jump host. Um, we discovered that I think they had 10 users of the 10 users, three of them were using their username as their password, right? These are Linux boxes. Um, so we got on that box. And then we just sort of had a little bit of fun looking for, looking for files. And we found one of their keys, one of the, the keys that um, uh, eventually basically just got us into the 96 hosts uh, behind that one box, right? Uh, and then it got worse from there because then we figured out that, oh yeah, they checked it into GitHub, they, and the key didn't have a password on it, right? So. Once you have access to that, get access to everything. Um, same thing with the same thing with the AWS servers, AWS instances. Hmm. All right. 
So I think the other, you know, one of the things that people don't think of is, is that their dev environment is linked to production, right? And so they'll leave things wide open or without controls on it because they have a timeline, right? And the timeline is we've got three months to get code pushed, right? And that makes sense, but however, uh, if you're leaving co keys that are the same between those environments, you can use those, in, those keys to leverage access to the other, the other, these other environments. It's really awful. Um, yeah. Uh, don't store your credentials or keys in Git, right? Uh, there, there is actually a Python tool that will go through and look in your, your Git repo to pull out uh, SSH keys from Git. Uh, I, I tried to look it up the other day and I totally blanked it. But uh, the other thing you can do is just look for ID underscore star in your Git repos. Um, and in fact, I did this on our enterprise Git repo and I was sort of blown away at how much stuff comes back, right? Uh, use strong hashing and do security testing. I think that's the biggest thing is like, if you're doing a development, if you're making, if you're developing an app, you're, you're doing the dev work yourself, you should have someone come in and test the security of it, right? Or at least do a code review and go, oh, wait a minute, you shouldn't be using SHA-1 because no one uses that anymore. Don't create credentials lying around. Encrypt your private keys and use agent forwarding. Does everybody know what agent forwarding is? Okay, so agent forwarding, you load your key up on your local machine. Um, and then when you SSH out, you tell SSH, hey, do agent forwarding. So now your private key only lives on your machine and you have basically a tunneled port that gets tunneled out to the next hop. So if I wanna get to machine, like let's say machine C, and I have to go you know, A, B to C, you can use SSH forwarding to forward your private key or your agent that can validate your public key all the way out, right? And so your private keys don't have to live anywhere but on your machine. And that's key, right? Because your, your private key then has a password on it. It only gets loaded into your machine. That agent, the agent forwarding only allows uh, machines you're connecting to to authorize your access, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the chance of someone stealing it, I mean, there, there is a chance that someone could steal that agent forwarding, but the chance is much lower than just having a key that's sitting out there unencrypted that anybody can steal and then reuse a million times, right? So um, learning, learning how, well, making sure you encrypted your private key on your machine is one aspect, and then learning how to set up agent forwarding, right? It's just in the SSH config file. Um, I think Putty may have some config options for it as well, but it's, it's really just setting that up, right? That reduces a lot of the risk. All right. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Uh, top five. One, uh, SSH agent forwarding. Uh, two, probably, I mean, what, what's your industry like? Um, a little bit of everything. What's that? A little bit of everything. Okay. Uh, OWASP security procedures and policies and things like that. So o OWASP has a whole write-up on how to do secure hashing, right? And if you go to their website, it has all that stuff laid out, right? So that's a, that's a good takeaway. Um, and then educating the users to not leave shit lying around. Educating the developers, right? Educating the developers that you don't check private keys into GitHub, right? It's, it's, a, it's a retraining of them, of the users, of the developers or GitHub users, to get them to not do that. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. 
There, there are talks about Bcrypt. Yeah, um, Vcrypt uses Blowfish, and I, I, I don't remember off the top of my head who developed the Vcrypt. I don't, I don't think it was Microsoft, uh, but I don't remember. They could, yeah. So, but the, the, the secure hashing page from OWASP, the, web, the wiki, does actually go into, I think it's four different hashing algorithms uh, that you could potentially use in and out. All right, big hand for David. All right, and you're probably getting tired of hearing this, but uh, please fill out the speaker survey cards in the back of the room. Let us know what you thought uh, for this talk and all the others we've seen today. It'll really help us out. Thank you. <laughs>